Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see you here. For those of you who are in person and the majority of us that are worshiping online today through Facebook Live, we want to welcome you to our service of of worship here today. We want to encourage you. Uh, it is great to gather as the church, but we are in unique times uh, right now. So we're grateful for the gifts of modern technology and the availability for us to do this by all means uh, necessary. So if you're watch, wa watching online this morning, we want to encourage you to gather as community and interact with each other, comment uh, and talk with each other. You're feel free to do that uh, during the worship service and engage and welcome each other in acts of hospitality today. So I want to invite you at this time, let us stand and let us prepare to worship God this morning. Amen. You warmed up yet? Yeah? Good. You sound good. You sound good. Hey, I want to teach you a, a new song this morning. This is called King of My Heart, and it's a good one. I think you're going to like it. It goes like this. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song, cause you are good. 
Inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, so he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, so he is my song. Let's sing that again. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails. The anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, good, oh, you are good. Let us pray. Father God, we come together today and we bless you. We praise you. We love you, oh God. We ask that you would just inhabit this space with us this morning. That as we gather today, that we would worship in spirit and truth. Lord God, may your spirit pour out upon us. Those who are gathered here, those who are gathered online today. We pray that you would speak with conviction through the power of the scriptures and the spoken word today. That the teaching today would be useful to our Christian faith. That we may be more bold and faithful witnesses for you. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Because you are good, good. be seated.
strange times to, uh, to be the church um, on a Sunday like this Sunday. How do we uh, proceed when we're amidst uh, something that is really um, something we've never experienced before? I've never pastored during a pandemic. I, I'm not sure exactly what's, uh, what's the right move always, and how do you discern um, how to be uh, the community of faith, the body of Christ together? How do we gather, and how do we connect with one another uh, during these these times. So it's been a wild ride for, for uh, being your pastors, um, staff members, as we've discerned this week uh, how to, to go about being in worship together. So I'm so thankful for technology that we do have, for many people to gather with us. Um, we, uh, we've had uh, a number of folks watching online, and so we welcome you in worship today as, as we've had uh, also um, this limited uh, in-person uh, group come as well. And we thank you for, for supporting us and and being able to offer some social distance. I appreciate your practicing social distancing. It's the it's a newest term of the week, right? To keep some social distance among us. So um, it's the first time I've actually been, been glad that you didn't show up this morning in large numbers. This is a nice small crowd and we can, uh, we can be in worship together and, and hopefully be faithful and safe together as well. It's a, it's a strange time, as I said. I went to the, the grocery store on Friday. Have you been to the grocery? It's a, it's, it's a little different. Um, you know, I, I went. I didn't have to go, but I was kind of curious. What does a sold-out toilet paper aisle look like, right? No hand sanitizer on the shelves at, uh, at the store. And uh, that's a, a strange phenomenon to, uh, to be a part of these days in which um, somehow the fear that we have has been made manifest through that kind of act of, of being sure we have enough for ourselves and, and for our own. Um, that's a, it's a strange thing to see. You know, medical professionals tell me that actually soap and water is better than hand sanitizer anyway. So, so keep using the hands, uh, washing the hands, that's a, that's a good practice. It's, a, it's something we can continue to do. Um, but it shows something of our character, doesn't it? My experience at the, at the grocery store it shows something about our, our collective character. What, what's gonna be most important to us? What's, uh, what's the best way for us to be community together? Are we only looking out for ourselves, make sure that our family has enough of the toilet paper and the hand sanitizer and hoarding that for ourselves? Or is there some way that we might ration things? This is really does show something of our character to, uh, to go to the grocery store these days and see what's flying off the shelves. I was considering whether or not I should change um, the direction of my, my message this morning from what I originally um, was, was going to be talking about. I, I thought about perhaps a, a go-to passage for me in Zechariah 9, uh, verse 2, that, that says uh, we should be prisoners of hope. Maybe, maybe that's the message I should be uh, focusing on. How do we live hopefully nowadays? How can we be prisoners of hope? Or you could go to a, a go-to phrases in which Jesus says, uh, my peace I give to you, uh, my peace I leave with you. I don't give as the world gives. Uh, something about uh, being uh, unafraid that, that Jesus would preach about. Um, be not afraid. I, I could go there and was thinking about seriously changing the direction of my message for this morning. But then I was looking again at the, at the worship series that we're, we're uh, exploring right now, Saving the Best for Last, in which we're looking at Jesus' last week of his life during this season of Lent as we as we go towards Easter, uh, saving the best for last has been an opportunity for us to see what does Jesus teach and model for us in the Christian faith that, that might enliven us to, to celebrate the, the resurrection on Easter in a new way. And I got to thinking that, you know, this is really on point. This is actually the thing we should consider on, uh, on this Sunday of, of, uh, of gathering in, in kind of new ways and, and how best to be the community of faith, the body of Christ together. So I'm sticking with the, that's, that sermon series that we're a part of, um, Saving the Best for Last. Last week, we, we looked at uh, Jesus' uh, teaching about what's the most important, what's the greatest commandment he was asked. And he said it is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We might call that the Jesus Creed, the way to live uh, the Christian life is to live in love and, and to do that by expressions of love for God and love for of neighbor. Certainly that's a good message for us uh, today. How do we look out for our neighbor? How's the best way to, uh, to consider those who are vulnerable? Uh, to love our neighbor is a good, a good thing for us to consider in our Christian life. And today we're looking 
at a story that comes out of the upper room. Now, the upper room um, is notorious for, for one particular uh, act of, of the Christian faith that, uh, that we practice, the, the, um, the sacrament of communion, uh, the Lord's Supper, celebrated in the upper room. But there's, there's a lot of other things you can also kind of lift up. Uh, the teachings that Jesus offers, I offer you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you, uh, furthers that notion of what he taught about loving God and loving neighbor. But then there's also this modeling, this act of hospitality and service and humility that Jesus offers that we want to look at today in our, what his teaching, his modeling in his last week, what was most important for him to convey to his disciples. We look at this morning in the Gospel of John chapter 13. We've come to call it the foot washing story, the story of, of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. I don't know how you feel about foot washing. Um, kind of strange, really, right? I mean, in the 21st century, we do not expose our feet to, to our neighbors, uh, strangers especially. And so it's not the kind of thing that, that's easily practiced. I've never really offered foot washing in, in uh, the congregations I've served. I, I have done it with youth, uh, and it felt a little strange there too. But, um, so it's a little bit weird for us to think about foot washing in general in the 21st century, but churches do offer it. On, uh, on Monday, Thursday, uh, before receiving communion, they, they have an opportunity for people to, uh, to do foot washing. And, and, uh, and so it's strange to us. It seems like just not something that we really do commonly today. But in Jesus' day, it was a common practice, right? Foot washing was a necessary act of, of hygiene, perhaps, but they did it because it was just an act of hospitality. When you came to uh, someone's home, they offered you some water, and a, and a towel in order for you to wash your feet as you entered their house. It, it kept things kind of cleaner and also gave you a, a chance to kind of freshen up before a meal, you washed your feet. So that was not uncommon. That practice was something very much uh, that Jesus um, would have experienced uh, throughout his life, his days, and the disciples as well. So they wouldn't be weirded out like we would be about foot washing. What's strange, what's unique, is who does the foot washing in this story. A servant? Sure. That's what you'd expect in the household. Or you do it yourself. That, that would be expected. But listen with me for the word of God found here in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. And we will have some, uh, some red type that is the words of Jesus. And I'd ask you as the body of Christ also you at home to do this as well, to, uh, to read those red letter words of Jesus uh, with us uh, as we encounter the gospel. Now, before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper... Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to Jesus, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. Thanks be to God for this reading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is trading places here. He's re 
reversing everything that the disciples would have expected in that moment. They were expecting a servant to come and perhaps do the washing of their feet or that they would do their own washing of their feet. But it was the call, the heights of humility for Jesus to take the role of a servant and express his love and care for his disciples in this way. In today's gospel, Jesus models discipleship, what it looks to be a follower of Jesus. He also models leadership and what leadership should look like in our world. Remember that these are the actions of Jesus, a leader of these disciples, and that he is one we now know was on his way to the humiliating death on the cross. We know that in hindsight, and in this moment, he shows them a bit of what the cross-shaped life is going to look like. Humility, hospitality, service. He has saved the best for last in his teachings with his disciples. Here is what's most important. In this last week of his life, he offers not only the teaching of love God and love your neighbor, but the modeling of how to be a, a servant and a leader in the community of followers of Jesus. Jesus gives his followers a teaching, the centrality of what humility and service is to be about. I'm sure that his words are to be taken seriously by pastors, but also by all of the community of faith. All of us are in our baptism called to be followers of Jesus who live out Jesus' teaching, right? We are all ministers. We are called to that in our baptism, and so we are to live in the same way that Jesus taught his disciples. This word is for us, all of us, in the body of Christ. Leadership in the name of Jesus takes its lead from Jesus. Jesus modeled and called forth a peculiar sort of leadership, different from what the disciples would have been seeing beyond Jesus in their day. The leaders of Jesus' day evidently thought of themselves as exceptional, that they were above the rest, the Gospels tell us this, that they, they would seek out to be, um, to be role models that, uh, that were above the rest of the people. They were the, uh, the superstars of their time. They were the spiritual elitists. They were the prototypes for piety. They were God's X factor. They thought they were the dream team kind of people, the religious leader, leaders of Jesus' day. Nothing made them happier than to be honored in the banquets, the Gospels tell us that the religious leaders of the day wanted to have the best seats at the banquet. They, they found a way to get to the head of the table, right? And so Jesus is speaking to his disciples and saying, that's a model, and then offers them another model completely from what they've been seeing. Not to be respected in the marketplace, not to be seen with the right religious bling, the, the right adornment so that you would be known from afar as being a religious leader of the day. In fact, here's a picture of, a, of one um, religious leader uh, currently today in the Jewish tradition that has uh, this large um, adornment on his forehead, right? And, and what's housed in that adornment is the, the words of the Shema, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and mind. That was what they were placing there. They wanted everybody to see it in a, in a major way. So they would tie this on. It's called a phylactery, and that's what, what they would do. They tie it onto their forearm as well. These teachings that were to be a, a reminder to them personally, but to their families, to teach loving God and loving neighbor. But to, to do it in the height of arrogance is to, to make it visible from a distance that you are practicing your faith in that way. Jesus what does Jesus do to show how to be a leader in, among his disciples? Well, in the place of arrogance, Jesus models humility. He models service to his disciples, to you and I, this morning in the foot washing narrative. Surely Jesus isn't simply addressing the problems of the leaders in his synagogue. He is teaching the leaders within the faith community in general and so this story captured by John in his gospel conveys it to us as well in the 21st century as a way to live and to lead and to practice our Christian faith. That is, he's teaching us uh, how we are to be his followers in a real direct way. He's modeling it 
for his disciples, for us today. Jesus builds right into the community, right from the first, a suspicion of titles, pride of place and position, special clothing in order to be seen in public. The leaders who lead in Jesus' name are to lead with humility and service. Humility is an interesting word. When you, when you look it up in the, in the dictionary, um, it has its root in the same word as humus, which is basically compost, right, dirt. And on Ash Wednesday, we gather to remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. So it is that humility is about returning to the source of, of who we ultimately have been and where we have come from, that we are, are, are dust, and that dust we shall return return to, that gives us a a sense of what's most important when we humble ourselves, when we take the role of a servant as Jesus offered his disciples. Perhaps this Sunday is a good reminder of this peculiar nature of what Christian servanthood and leadership looks like in our world. How do we think about the most vulnerable today with this virus scare that's going on? How do we remember them and and not necessarily look out for just ourselves, but the common good. What does it look like to do that in our world? Is this not a model for how we are all to be Christian in our lives today? Leadership today takes a lot of different forms. You can can go and look at uh, at various um, books that will give you guidance as to how to be a leader Today, I went to the Cedar Falls Public Library this week, and I found this shelf, just chock full of management and leadership kind of books. Right there in the middle is this book right here, entitled Servant Leadership in Action. I thought that was a good placement of the book, right there in the middle, uh, among all those other books on leadership, Servant Leadership in Action. I remembered that... uh, in the 90s, when I began ministry, in the late 90s, uh, this was a, a topic that was being discussed among um, corporate leaders. They were talking about the model of servant leadership at that time, and, uh, and it always kind of stuck with me that that was being discussed as a way to, to lead. Today, I'm not so sure that that's being lifted up in a large way um, as a way to lead, to be a servant, to have humility. What is the character of a leader these days? How does a leader look for truth and honesty and and find ways of of doing so that would serve the common good? Instead of looking out for self, how is there some promotion of of all together, that there would be servants of all? Servant leadership is a a model for leading that, that can still be a very much a way that even in the workplace, you can have servant leaders. I remember when I moved here to Cedar Falls, it was July of 2018, got the uh, Waterloo Courier, and there was an article um, about uh, a gentleman by the name of Mud, the Mud Advertising Group, and the title of uh, the article was something about servant leader, referred to him as a servant leader, went to talking with people about about his his, uh, teaching in the Cedar Valley, He, he really is focused on on the work of this servant leadership that, uh, that this book um, by Ken Blanchard and Renee Broadwell is about. Uh, the, the founder of kind of the servant leader movement was in the 70s. His name is Robert Greenleaf. If you're curious about how that uh, servant leader uh, experience happens in the, in the corporate world, uh, that's kind of the, the key person to go to. It's, a, it's an act of humility to serve uh, in this way of leadership. To, to find some way of always connecting and listening to others and, and finding ways to build trust and the common good within the, the group that, that you're leading is the effort there. One of the best stories I know about servant leadership and humility comes by way of the story of a gentleman who arrived in 1953 in Chicago. He was going to be receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. He was getting off the train in Chicago in 1953, and he stepped off the train. He had uh, bushy hair and a big mustache, uh, this gentleman here. And as cameras were flashing, as city officials were gathering to want to be seen with him as he got off the train, um, he, he was uh, starting to greet those, those folks. But then he, uh, he thanked them politely and uh, excused himself for a minute, went through the crowd of reporters and, and dignitaries uh, from Chicago there, Um, And he walked through the crowd 
And he found there, uh, there was an elderly woman, an elderly black woman, was carrying two large suitcases. And he grabbed them from her and proceeded to walk alongside her as she was getting on the bus. And he placed those suitcases on the bus near wherever the baggage handler was and then uh, said farewell to her as she entered the bus, as he helped her get on the bus. As he was then returning to the crowd that was gathered to see him, Albert Schweitzer uh, turned to the crowd. He apologized for keeping them waiting as he had done this act of kindness. And it was reported that one member of the reception committee told the reporter that day, that's the first time I ever saw a sermon walking. A sermon walking. That's what Jesus was about that day in the foot washing. He was giving them a sermon by way of his modeling it for them. This is the way you should be among yourselves going forward, he was offering to them. This is the way that you are to act among our community. Humility is using your power in service to other people. Humility is letting go of our need to be the most important person in the room in the gathering that day. Can we see things from the point of view of the vulnerable today? Do we do that? Can we do it in a real way so that we're not hoarding things for ourselves but finding how we can kind of make sure everybody gets enough? Can there be medications that are available for everyone? Is there some way we can do that in the common good? Are there ways that we can lead in that way if we're given the opportunity to lead? How can we do that in a very real way? I believe Jesus teaching his foot washing modeling of servant leadership is a, is a way for us today and in our world that we live in today. The heart of a servant looks out for the needs of others. The heart feels the pain for those who've lost in some way, lost a home in a tornado, have some vulnerability to a virus, the pain of losing a loved one, grieving their loss. It's the heart of a servant that has compassion for those who are going to lose their jobs, who are going to be on the edge and the margins right now during this time in our world. Servants always have good and loving and generous hearts, and they also have hands that in order to live out what is on their heart, they put it into action. They show compassion. They are of service to others. Compaction and actions are the marks of the Christian servant. In the gospel today, Jesus shows us servanthood through foot washing. Lutheran preacher Ed Marcourt puts it this way, being a servant is a must, a demand, he says. Being a servant is a demanding thing, and it's a way we are to be Christ followers, he suggests. Is that saying too much? That to be a Christian is to be a servant? That's what Marcourt suggested. He said that uh, water isn't water if it's, if it's not wet. Fire isn't fire if it's not hot. Ice isn't ice if it's not cold. And a Christian isn't a Christian unless they're serving. Is that saying more than we could expect, that every Christian should be a person of service? Is he saying too much? Is that not correct? Can we model that? Can we live into that? Is that a truth that we're willing to uphold? If a follower of Christ is not a servant, he or she is not a disciple. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. Let's consider that for a moment. For a moment, what does that look like in your home life? If you're married, what does that look like to, to be a servant of your spouse, vice versa? How, what does that look like practically, in reality? How do we serve one another if we're married? How does that happen in our homes, in, in our communities that we live in? How do we be of service and not only look out for what my preference is and what need I have? How do we do that, really, actually? Is that possible? to be of service in our world, in our homes. How about parents being servants of their children? Is that possible? Is that a way to look at things? How about children being servants of their parents? What does that look like practically, actually? Can it be done? 
Can we live that way as children and as parents? How about in our workplace? Is it possible to live this out, to actually be of service to the people we work with, our coworkers, our boss, our boss being a servant to us and vice versa? Does that even play out as a reality? If it's water, it's wet. If it's fire, it's hot. If it's ice, it's cold. If it's going to be a servant and a follower of Jesus, they're going to serve and be of service in some way. Jesus invites us to be servants, not only servants within our marriages and our families, but in our church too, finding ways to be of service, to build up the body of Christ, to make things happen in order that Jesus might be proclaimed in the workplace, in our home life in our community, in our world today. Practice what you teach. Offer compassion. Focus on God. Is that not what we are called to today as we encounter the foot washing story of Jesus? In the end, we don't get anywhere by exalting ourselves. In the end, the only real way to lift things is to explore the heights of humility. That is to go low in order to reach high. Is that not what Jesus models? Can we not be that kind of Christian in our world? The words that Jesus gives us today, the modeling, the teaching that he offers, whoever would be great must be servant. So be it, and may it be so. Receive this, uh, this prayer as we close today. This is an unknown author who wrote a prayer for a pandemic, and I offer this prayer for us today. Let us pray. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips remember those that have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Oh God, we offer you this prayer. And we pray that you would guide us in acts of compassion and service to the needs of our world. Help guide us in being faithful followers of Christ. As we join in the prayer he taught, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we've gathered for worship. May we continue to grow as disciples of Jesus, that we might go in service with the love of Christ, the grace of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.